Hey everybody, so it's James from My Breeder Supply. I feel like I'm in a, 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 a lineup for some kind of a murder investigation with this thing like this. But the reason I'm doing this is because we had some comments from people who said we can't read the sign. And so that's kind of stupid on our behalf. So we haven't printed another bigger sign, which we will do, because we're just too cheap. And this is a, you know, but here we go. At least you can see it. And now we'll stick it over here and where it's hard to read. Okay. So this is our question and answer session that we do weekly. So here are some questions and hopefully appropriate answers from this last week. All right. Sit down. Oh, all right, thank you. <laughs> I have a French Bulldog and a Merrill English Bulldog pups with only one testicle. Well, I'm hoping that they, they don't share a testicle between the two dogs because that is a problem. But if they each only have a single testicle, that's also a problem. So the question is, they're age 14 weeks old. Should I be worried or not? Or just wait? Well, the answer is, the quick answer is just wait. But the long answer is this. So what's going on is you've got the abdominal cavity and the testicles are formed up in the abdominal cavity and they go through a hole and they drop below as obviously two testicles that you can see hanging in the air. So what can happen is, is that they, if they've got to go through this hole and as they get bigger, they won't go back up through the hole. So if you have a dog, those testicles are still up in the abdominal cavity. The problem is, is they've got to have descended typically by six months is the age we use. If they've not descended by six months, then they will stay here forever. And a dog with an undescended testicle or testicles has a much higher chance of getting testicular cancer. So they then have to neuter the dog. So the dog, you know, so the, the right answer is at six months or more, undescended, undescended testicle, neuter the dog. You can do some things to get that testicle to descend prior to six months. And you could do a daily thing of basically moving around the skin around the abdomen, getting that testicle to descend, and just generally kind of manipulating it and see if you can make that testicle stay there. Because you could fix the problem. If you don't do anything, it may, nature may take care of it and it may not. All right. Is there a, a, a medical term they could look up on Google? Yes, to help it's them called a, a dog with a single testicle is called uh, chiprotic or CH something chiropotic. I don't forget the exact name. If you put that on the same testicle, you'll find the answer. But yeah, so you can get more information on Google on that, absolutely. Okay. How do I, this is uh, Tosh, um, Tosh Gilahuli. How do I tell if a puppy is solid blue as opposed to a blue? So, I'm not exactly sure what he's asking here, but I mean, the answer is, is that you can get dogs that are blue with a white patch, very common. Uh, obviously, if you see the white patch, then it's not a solid blue dog. M more typically, what you mean by this is, is it does it have brindle present? <clears throat> a dog that's blue with a copy of brindle will show some degree of striping in that blue fur it may be tigered up like crazy. Uh, it may just have a single little mark on the back end of its flank. It's a typical place to see this on their butt <clears throat> with a dog hardly has any brindle at all. But any brindle showing up on that dog means that dog has a copy of brindle. I hope that answers your question. What kind of dog food do you feed and do you recommend raw food? We don't, we don't do raw food, but lots of people do. Lots of people swear by it. There are some issues with raw food with things like salmonella and things like this. So I think that if you've got to do raw food, then you've got to make sure that you know you keep the, the, the raw food refrigerated, you're handling it properly. You know, there are some definite dangers with raw food. What's the best diet? Well, I think probably a raw food diet is probably great, uh, but it's definitely a lot more, lot more work. Obviously, a bit, probably a bit more expensive. We feed um, alpha dog whitefish is what we feed, and we but we change foods quite a bit because we're always experimenting on what food we like. Um, but we've been doing that for a couple of years. We, we, we pretty much like that product. I mean, there's some scares out there to do with uh, these uh, grain-free diets and they can be causing problems with hearts with dogs. I've done some looking at this. Uh, you know, I think that probably, there's probably some truth to some of it, but it's probably fairly unlikely that you'll actually experience it. But I, I think the thing here is, is uh, it depends on the kind of dog you have, but if you're specifically having dog allergy problems, then start switching up to other dog foods. So maybe try grain, fruit, grain free dog food, or maybe a fish based dog food. They may help. But again, it's all anecdotal evidence, and so honestly, I mean, I think it's very hard to answer this question and know that I'm giving you good information. Does a brindle pup, this is Michael Tinsley, does a brindle pup always carry the brindle gene? 
or can it show Brindle and not carry it? A dog that shows Brindle has a copy or two copies of Brindle. If a dog doesn't have any copies of Brindle, it will not show it. So the, the quick answer to this is that, that a dog that doesn't have Brindle will never show Brindle. Uh, Leslie Jenkinson's in the UK, can we buy the progesterone kit and, and, and uh, would you use it or not? Uh, love your videos, it says nice things about us and so on and so forth and that's nice. Yeah, so uh, so the, the target, the, the kit we're talking about is the target ovulation test kit. I think I may have one in here. I'm going to get off camera for a second. I do. Tick, tick, There we go. <clears throat> you can tell all this is just, you know, it's on the fly stuff with our videos. So this is the product she's, he's talking, she's talking about right here. So we use a lot of this. You get 12 kits. This is in the US. 12 kits, $144, two-day shipping. Um, and it's relatively straightforward. You do have to draw blood. You do have to centrifuge the blood. There's ways you can do that by just simply waiting or using a ceiling fan to centrifuge the blood. But we use the heck out of these. And um, I do have videos that shows this being used for what's called a reverse progesterone when you're getting close to whelping. On these days, I'm not in favor of that particularly. I don't think this is accurate enough for that. But I do use this for timing my the AIs that we do here locally. Uh, can you buy this in the US? I don't know. This is made by um, um, Biometallics is the manufacturer of the product. Biometallics is the manufacturer. In Princeton. Did it say that? Yeah, Princeton, okay. New Jersey. Okay, they're the manufacturer of it. We buy it from targetvet.com. I don't know whether this thing is shippable to, to the UK because of you know customs restrictions, so I don't know the answer to that. You'd have to go check. Uh, but anyway, we like it. Yes, we use it. I mean, you've got to do something. To, you know, if you want to get, be successful in breeding your dogs, then you know, I think that the only way to really get things right is to do a progesterone test. Lab progesterone tests are great. They're expensive. They typically take two days. This is not as accurate. You get results within nine minutes, and it's inexpensive. So we like this. Uh, Ryan Cassidy, do you ship pups to New York? Yes, we have a nanny service that does this. So our nanny service picks up our puppies from Oklahoma City Airport and they fly in the cabin with the other human beings to any major airport uh, anywhere in the United States, Alaska, Hawaii. The cost to ship a puppy is something between four and five hundred bucks depending on where it's going. We've, we don't have a lot of puppies because we just got three girls, so we don't have a lot of puppies every year. But you know, we've been using that service uh, for probably eight years now. We don't ever ship dogs cargo. We don't like cargo at all. Um, not, not that it can't be done, but certainly super safe. Puppy goes on the plane, rides most of the way on the nanny's lap. Everybody around there thinks the dog's cute as hell. I went and picked up three dogs in California here a few years ago. And uh, we, we, it was a small plane, and we were literally, those dogs were the hit of the plane. Nobody got served a drink on that, on, that, on that trip because the stewardesses, or the whatever you call them these days, flight attendants, excuse me, the flight attendants, were literally playing with the puppies and taking them to all the people and let them pet our puppies. So it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a two-hour flight. Nobody got a drink, but everybody apparently was happy. Um, okay. Oh, okay, well... This here is good morning, how much is the price of the puppy like the one you have in the video? So I think this is a video I did on health, on health uh, uh, checking and this was actually a lilac puppy that we just got, it's gonna be one of our stud dogs. Yes. That dog was, uh, our, we paid 10 grand for that dog. So there's your, there's your answer what we paid for that dog. Um, if I was selling that dog, I'd probably sell it for more. I mean, it's a really nice dog, um, but, uh, but hopefully that dog will be a great stud dog. And if I was selling that dog, it'd probably be close to 12,000. But this is the deal. Dog prices are all over the place, and uh, um, you know, you can maybe buy a lilac dog for two thousand dollars. But uh, you know, buyer beware. You know, the more you pay, the more likely you're going to get a really nice dog. But it's not always that way. Fernando Gonzalez, hello. I'm currently looking to get a French bulldog. I'm looking for a color that I was told it's a blue chocolate with tan. But I was told they're really expensive. Would you have to have one? Okay. Well, here we get a plug for my dogs. Well, I do have some uh, chocolates that carry blue. Uh, I've got some lilacs right now. I've got a litter of two boys and two girls, and they're actually on my website, www.lovemypups.com, with prices and videos and pictures. So take a look. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Um, 
Luis Leon, Lilac Sable, and a Brew Brindle. Can breeding work? Well, yeah. I mean, you can breed, you can breed a uh, um, a Chihuahua to a of any color to a, a Great Dane, and it'll work. You may not want the results. So, what would you get if you breed a Lilac Sable and a Blue Brindle? Well, Pundit Square time. So let's look. So that is a lilac is a whoops. Oh, I messed it up already. Can you see this up here, Russ? Okay. Oh, make it work. Okay. So a lilac is a blue dog, which is dilution, little needle, and it is a chocolate dog. Uh, and this dog is a sable, and I have to know that all sables never have brindle. So that's what we know about that dog. We don't. It could be other things we don't know about. It could have ten points. What does he say about that? It could have ten points. It could have, it could have <coughs> hide. We don't know about those things, but we do know about that. So that's one dog. The other dog is. Oh no, I want some. A blue brindle. All right. So the the other dog is blue and I'm going to assume that it's not chocolate and I'm going to assume it has one copy of Brindle. So the question is what do you get if you breed those dogs together? Right, so remember the way this works is these are all independent things on the dog's uh, color DNA. So each one of these is completely independent. That's not always the case because there are certain things like creams and, black and masks that are dependent. But in this case, they're all independent. Okay, so what are you going to get? If you put a, a, a non-brindle dog with a dog that has a copy of brindle, half the dogs are going to be KNKB and half the dogs will be KNKN. So you're going to get dogs that are KBKN, which is a brindle, and you're going to get dogs that are KNKN, non-brindle. So half the dogs show a copy of Brindle, half the dogs don't. This one's easy, because the combination of these two has to always be this. That is a chocolate dog married to a non-chocolate dog. Every puppy has to be a, a, a non-chocolate dog with a copy of chocolate. So they're chocolate carriers. And then what happens here? This one's easy as well, because all you can get from these mixes is DD. So what are we going to have? We will have, if you had two puppies in the litter, you'd get one puppy that was a blue, <clears throat> that is a chocolate carrier, whoops, going to draw it right, which is a, a chocolate carrier, which has one copy of Brindle, KNKB, and you'd get the other puppy, on average, that would be blue, that is a chocolate carrier, that would not have any Brindle. So there's your answer. So you'd get blue dogs, which half of them would carry Brindle and half of them wouldn't. Okay. Uh, Faith Irvin, <coughs> I have two golden retrievers and I need to help breeding. When my male comes around and licks her and sniffs on her, she'll put her tail up, so she's flagging. What we're talking about is she puts her tail over the side, which is called flagging, which means, by the way, that she's almost certainly in heat. <coughs> Once he hops up on her, she tails him off. <laughs> turns around, bites, and says, get off me, all right? Um, they've been together since they were pups. They are not related. They'll be turning four in two months. I need help. I don't know what to do. Should I try artificial inbreeding? She seems like she's ready, but she'll let him mate. Uh, she will let a male, but just not him. Uh, I think she is the dominant one in their relationship. Uh, do you think she'll let him eventually? Um, what should I do? Any tips and tricks? Yes, right. So I do have some videos on the way dogs behave. So the typical situation is this. I think there's two parts to this question. The first one is you've got two dogs who are running around all the time together and they're very familiar with each other. And uh, you know, the, you know maybe, the, maybe the girl's dominant, maybe she's not, but I can tell you this, when dogs are in heat, female dogs, they pretty much decide what's gonna happen. They can be over-dominated by a male, and be forced to breed, but there there may be a fight. So typically, what the behaviour is normally this: day one, first signs of blood on the ground. That dog is typically going to be bred about day eleven through thirteen. Uh, I would recommend that if you have a male you're going to use, you separate them. You don't want them. You want to get the anticipation up there for the male 
so that he's really going to try and get the job done when it's time to get the job done. So keep them apart. I mean, put them in different buildings. I mean, if you put the male in, a, in the bedroom and the female's running around on the house, the female will probably be up there by the door and that male will just be tearing up your door trying to get to the male. So we want to have no pressure on the male for at least the first week of this process so that you can just go about being a dog and not trying to be a stud dog. So what I'm saying here is separate those things too. Um, right, so the next thing is, is then, you know, her blood color will start to lighten up typically around day nine. And we're gonna do a little drawing here of this whole thing. And so, so about day nine is about the time the dog is ovulating. And a dog that's ovulated will typically be bred about two days after that. Now there is a difference between the kind of thing that I do with stud dogs where I ship it out and we can't just keep shipping out every day so it's too expensive. So we have to get our timing on the money. But for somebody who has the dogs present, you don't necessarily have to do progesterone tests, you can let the dogs tell you. And now I've got to find that black pen that I had. <clears throat> there it is. All right, so this is what's going on with the dog. So this is, uh, this is day zero. And this is day 13. <clears throat> and most dogs get bred between day 11 and 13. That's typical. This is breeding time. Now, that doesn't mean that every dog is going to fall into this. It could get scooted out here at day 20, and it could be earlier at day 8. But that's typically what happens. Right. So then the markers are this. The next thing that's significant that happens is day 9. And that is typically ovulation. Day zero through day nine, the dog is dripping red discharge. And the progesterone level doesn't do very much till about day three. So I've got my scale about right. Day three, the progesterone levels are less than a one. <clears throat> At day nine, ovulation. Typically, the, 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 at ovulation, the progesterone level will be five. So it takes a, it starts to go up about one point per day till you get to day nine. And at this point, the discharge color is typically turned pink in color, pink to vanilla. Now, the problem with this is, is that the blood discharge color is an indicator, but it's certainly not a guarantee that um, <clears throat> you, you can't just time it off this and get it right. You can time off it and get it right most of the time. All right, so we're breeding on day 11, and typically the day after this, the progesterone level is eight, and then the progesterone level's gone up 15, and then it really starts to go up after that. So this is, we're up here somewhere, so you can see it took a fairly steep climb after day nine. So, so <clears throat> day 10 is typically around an eight, and I've drawn that about right, so here we are at a five, here we are at an eight, and then we breed on the 15. So, so dog starts to flag, red discharge, shows the interest, will let dogs generally muck around with her. Probably won't let a dog mount her until we start to get up somewhere in here. This is about the point that a dog will let a, let a, a, a male mount her. So if you did a progesterone test, we'd expect to see a progesterone level of five, and we'd expect to see her blood color start to go pinker. Take a napkin, put it up her back here and start to get pinker. Um, so the, the, this particular question is, you know, for this particular person, what I would recommend is to separate your dogs. I don't know if you know where you are, but you know, sometimes dogs just can't get the job done. In Frenchies, now we do AI, we don't let them naturally breed because they typically have a hard time getting it done. So you can, and I've done this for labs, if they cannot get hooked up because she doesn't like the male dog, you could do an artificial insemination. And if you're up somewhere here, you're already in this for like two weeks and they haven't hooked up, I'd do an artificial insemination. So that's a long answer to a really short question. My boy is, a, is a, this is a, a Des Torres. My boy is two years old, he's a cream. What color female should I breed him to? And is he too old to start out? So is he too old to start out? No, definitely not. I mean. Now, I would start a dog out if it's a nice dog, he's got good behavior, and he's got two testicles, he has good health, then start the dog out. I've got dogs that are six years old and still studying. I mean, that's kind of getting to the end of typically when a dog will stud because of his semen quality. Um, but uh, two years old, absolutely fine. 
if you're going to start a dog out, you want to start working him, and uh, that's really a separate video, but you basically want to start working him so you can collect from him. You certainly don't want to be in a situation the day that you want to use him, you've never collected him from him before, and he just looks at you like, what are we doing? He doesn't know. You've got to make it a pleasurable experience from him, you've got to start doing it, you know, maybe at eight months old, start working with him every week, try to collect from him and get him in the habit where he knows what's going on. Uh, so Cream, what colour female should I breed him to? Well this is a really long question that can't just be answered, but I mean the answer is put creams with creams, you always get creams. What other colours does he have? Does he have blues? Does he have chocolates? He can have all those colours. Cream is like white paint, it covers everything on a dog. A cream dog could be a lilac dog, it's called a platinum. It could be a champagne dog, that's a, that's a cream dog that, that is also chocolate. It could be a blue carry, it could have brindle, it could have, you know, there's all kinds of things that could be going on here. So what dog, you know, you've got to know about the color DNA of your dog before you know what, what results you'll get when you put that with another female. Um, how long am I into this? 20 minutes. Am I really? God. AJ Rogers. Oh, uh, my Merle's eyes glow red. I know he carries blue, but I haven't had his DNA tested. Would most Merrill's eyes glow red? That's a good one because I don't really know the answer to this. I can tell you my experience with this. Every time I have ever been around a chocolate or a lilac dog, their eyes have glowed red. They have to be at least probably four, five, six weeks old before it really, you can really tell it. And at six months, they tell it great. I have never, ever seen a dog that didn't have a red eye glow that was known to be a chocolate or a lilac. I have three Merrells. I have a lilac Merrell has red eye glow because that dog causes chocolate as well because it's a lilac. I have two others, a male and a female, that are chocolate carriers. Their eyes do not glow red. So somebody made a statement to me that said all Merrells eyes glow red. I know that is not true, but some of them might. So I just don't have enough experience on this to categorically tell you that, that, that Merrells are like all other dogs and their, their eyes only glow red if they are chocolate. Um, would the red eye test work for a chocolate sable? This is AJ Rogers. Would the red, yes, so the answer is we're back to the same question. Any dog that chocolate, if it's a chocolate sable, if it's a, if it's a lilac, if, it's a, if it is a chocolate dog, which is this, you'll have a red eye glow, end of story. Now, can't test for chocolate in most Frenchies, so then the problem is, is the test comes back like this. Looks like it's not a chocolate dog. Has a red eye glow. It's actually a chocolate dog. Are you from the UK? How much your puppy sell from? Cheers. Well, I am. I was born in the UK. And what did my puppy sell for? It's all over the place. It really depends on the colors of the dogs. Cream dogs, 3,000. Pied dogs, 3,000. Blue dogs, 5,000. Blue and tan, 6,000. Lilac dogs, 10 to 12,000. Platinums, 15,000 and up. It's all over the place. But those are also dogs that have uh, all the attributes that you're looking for. In other words, they got like the bat ears and the small well, nose. Well, I mean, we, don't, we try to produce really nice, smaller, stocky Frenchies that have got great conformation. Absolutely. So, now you will see a I mean, you know, when you ask people on prices, I promise you it's all over the place. And so there'll be people who say, it's ridiculous to spend $1,500 on a French Bulldog. Hey, if you've got $1,500 to spend, you can find a French Bulldog for $1,500. But you're not going to get a top of the line lilac dog for $1,500. That's just the way it is. And if you think that's crazy, well, then it's crazy to you and don't buy that dog. But there's people like me. I mean, I've got a, I've got a platinum boy we just produced. I just got offered $30,000 for him. I didn't take it. So, you know, I can tell you that it is what it is, and you know, it, it, some people are horrified by these prices. And uh, hey, each their own. Um, somebody called Rancho Pedre is claiming that your dog is a stud of their litter. Uh, Zeus Lilac and Tan Masters. So my, I do have a boy who's who's called Zeus, and he is a Lilac and Tan, and he is Masters. So is is this the the stud? Quite likely so. But here's how you can find out. If somebody claims that a particular stud is this, is is that you know they use a particular stud, get the AKC number of the dog. With that AK, and by the way, if you go look at my site on my copy on my stud contracts, all of my dogs have their AKC numbers. There, it's not a secret. 
you go look at that AKC number, then go to my website, look up Zeus and see if it's got the same AKC number. And if it does, Zeus is the daddy. And the paperwork that you get will show the mom and the dad, the sire and the dame, and their AKC numbers on, if it's an AKC registered litter. And from that, you can confirm that the dog that you are buying, the puppy you are buying, does, is an offspring of those two dogs. So do your homework, because I promise you, I mean, I, I've seen videos of my wife in a video that somebody's claiming is their puppies, and they're not. And, you know, they're absolute liars and scam artists. So be careful. Um, uh, there was an interesting one here, and I haven't even come across it yet. Oh, somebody's asking, can you fit a centrifuge tube uh, into our Shipmate product? So the answer to this is that there is quite a bit of room inside, this is about 16 ounce container. Some of that room is taken up by the electronics that goes inside, so you lose some of the space. But as a short answer, the, the, you've got something in the order of four inches of depth and three inches of diameter. You could get a collection from an elephant in this thing. I'm serious. We don't use um, centrifuge tubes, we use whirl packs. And the reason for that is they're sterilized, they're extremely easy to use, and you roll them back down and you get all the air out of your sample. Oxygen is not a good thing to have in your sample. So we roll it down and we just have the fluid in there, and that then goes in here. And I mean, you could put 10 of these, 10 samples, into and ship 10 samples at one time. There are some issues about how you'd cool it down successfully to get that done, but I routinely send samples from a couple of dogs at the same time, and tons of room in there. I mean, this thing's way bigger than it needs to be. But, it, but so it's, you know, to have extra space is always a good thing. Um, and for every purchase of a shipmate, we provide for the customer's convenience 10 world yes. packs. We provide 10 of these, it's very good. We provide 10 of these, and they are very inexpensive. I mean, I buy a thousand at a time, and a thousand of these things might cost 50 bucks. They're very inexpensive. So, um, and, and they're just, you know, they're used by laboratories all over the world. It's all different sizes. This is a two ounce, this is a two ounce um, bag. And so that, that's, uh, I think it's a two ounce bag. I mean, and we're talking about when we ship, we're shipping, um, what, we're shipping five cc's, you know, a fifth of an ounce. So you've got, you know, tons of room here. It's just, the, it's, but yeah, you can use the centrifuge tubes. Yes, they'll fit in there. Uh, somebody asked me, what do we pay for this last question here before I get off? What do we pay for C-sections all over the place? So C-sections here in Oklahoma, in our town, typically 650 bucks. If you're in California, C-sections might cost you two or $3,000. If we drive to Texas one hour away, our C-section price drops to 250 bucks. How do we do that? Well, I'm gonna plug for my incubator. We take our portable incubator with us, got two different sizes. This is the smaller one. The puppy is, this one hasn't been cleaned up yet, it's supposed to be manufactured, but basically you can have about nine Frenchies in here. This goes into the operating room, the Frenchies are born, they get the breathing, they go straight into this. I just pull the plug on it, so we'll plug it back in. This thing runs on either your car, 12 volt, it comes with a cigarette lighter adapter, or it's plugged into the mains, and it will regulate the temperature. You can adjust the temperature. We set it to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 104 degrees centigrade. Excuse me, 40 degrees centigrade, which is, which is 104 degrees Fahrenheit. The nice thing about these things is, number one, they're pretty inexpensive, 295 bucks. They are portable. They will run off both household electricity and you get the adapter with it, or you get a, cigarette lighter adapter that comes with it, so it runs off your house. Um, and or your car. Or your car. And this thing, most of the incubators you see out there are forced air incubators. They have a light bulb or a heating element, and I have a fan, and they move, they continually move this air over the heating element, they dry the air out like crazy. That's not the way this works. The heating element is in the floor of this, so it does not dry the air out at all. So it's, in my opinion, a much, much better way of doing this. So the puppies don't get dried out. There is, event so your fresh air comes in so you can leave it closed. There is a little light inside it so that you can night time you don't have to wake everybody up to see what's going on that stays on permanently. Um, and I was going to say something else and I completely forgot what it is. Um, yeah. So, so you would put towels in the bottom of it? Uh, I put, actually what I do is I just go get some uh, 
it off camera for a second. This is what I do. <clears throat> I just put paper towels on it. Because newborn puppies are going to pee and poop and have little umbilical cords that are bleeding. <clears throat> I just throw that down the bottom of it. I just put my puppies on that. And then when I, that gets nasty, I throw that away and put on. But yeah, absolutely. Once your puppies are older, if you've got a puppy. So I've used these to save puppies that would never have survived. Puppies that are four ounces that really just would not survive being on mum. They've got to be in a separate environment so they can live. I've had puppies that live the first two weeks of their life in an incubator. By the side of my bed at night time, tube feed them in the middle of the night once. Um, absolutely a lifesaver. So saves you money if you're going to go do C-sections. And this is one of those things that, you know, do you need an incubator? Maybe not. But if you do enough of this, will you need an incubator? I guarantee it. And you'll need an incubator right now. A puppy that's got cold needs to be warmed up before anything else happens. And if you don't warm a puppy up, it will not survive. And the way to get it done is to regulate temperature and pop the puppy in here. So, uh, all right, well, thanks very much for looking at our videos. It's a bit long-winded. You've got comments, suggestions, things you like, great, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to us. If you hate what we're saying, tell us. If you've got things wrong, tell us. We'll, 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 we'll mention it and, and hopefully get it right next time. We're not infallible. All this information does not come from a vet. So remember that this is, uh, don't come and sue me if I give you bad information. We try to get as accurate as we possibly can, but I can promise you that every now and then we'll get things wrong. And if we've got it wrong, let us know. Good luck with your puppies. Love your puppies. Be nice to them. Bye-bye.